Welcome again to another episode of Nine Pandas, where we try to learn more about China. Today's topic, it's a very important one. It's China and the environment. And I'm very honored again to have uh, Dr. Harvey Zodin again as my guest, uh, who will share um, um, some information concerning that. Uh, just a quick introduction. Um, Harvey, you are a senior fellow of Beijing-based think tank Center for China and Globalization. Uh, you are a regular commentator and columnist at CGTN, CRI and others. You are a senior advisor of Tsinghua University School of Journalism and Communication, a former advisor of the Carter administration, a former vice president at ABC Television and a Juris Doctor at Harvard Law School. Also, you recently gave a speech about environmental challenges in China and beyond. Can the world survive? At the Confucius Institute at Bangor, which I will post a link in the description of this video. So thanks again, Harvey. Thanks for joining in. Yeah, Carly, thanks for having me on to discuss environmental issues and China with some relevant comparisons to the EU and uh, the United States. Thank you. Um, so what is your overview about China and the US um, concerning the environment? Well, Carly, along with the risk of future nuclear war, pandemics and food scarcity, the environment is the issue that could easily end life as we know it. And to me, it seems not to be discussed nearly enough. So you are to be commended for raising these critical issues. You probably know that the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists established their doomsday clock more than 75 years ago when they worried about a nuclear holocaust. Since that time, they've added the environment and other planet-threatening concerns. For the last three years, the clock has stayed at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been to game over. I dare say that with recent developments together with their consequences, like Putin's war on Ukraine, as his first step in reestablishing a combination of the great Russian empire and the powerful 20th century USSR, and with the U.S. Supreme Court starting to dismantle the United States administrative state, starting with gutting anti-business environmental regulations, that the picture is so bleak that it's likely that the doomsday clock will next be reset to a minute or even 30 seconds before Armageddon. So we have a great deal on our collective plates at the moment. So even if we can't get past the nuclear issue, which is 100% driven by humans, globally, we're failing miserably on the environmental issues that are a combination of human and physical factors. It's no wonder that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that we're sleepwalking to climate catastrophe and that the world community lacks the political will to achieve the agreed upon goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement to cut greenhouse gas emissions with a view to holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. Uh, Secretary General Guterres said that the 1.5 degree goal is on life support and intensive care. In my view, if we don't succeed in keeping the temperature rise to near 1.5 degrees, our glo global goose is surely cooked. And life as we know it, barring some unforeseen technological innovation, that life will be over. We can see almost every day now what's happening with our own eyes, but our worst fears are confirmed by the latest series of periodic reports assessing the science-based aspects of our global environment issued by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This series of periodic reports represents the global scientific community's most recent consensus by thousands of climate scientists 
and signed off by UN member states. Uh, and it's been issued since 1988. What is then the environmental trifecta facing China? Carly, you've no, no doubt heard the term dilemma many times, meaning having to choose between two difficult choices. But China's situation is even more complicated. It's a trilemma where the country faces a difficult choice among three important competing energy variables, affordability, environmental sustainability, and supply security. This is a classic case of juggling public policy choices and making the least bad decision. It's like a balloon. If you squeeze it in one place, it'll bulge out in other places. And it's always unpredictable. And it's sometimes inconvenient and often troublesome. And let me tell you that China's ruling Communist Party does have at least three overarching goals, serving the people, staying in power, and securing the public support to maintaining order. Two millennia ago, Cicero, the great Roman statesman and scholar and philosopher said, Salos populi suprema lex esto, the welfare of the people shall be the supreme law. Perhaps Chairman Mao Zedong said it most succinctly in 1944, serve the people. And I can tell you that serving the people is what the Chinese think their own government is doing so well. Many public opinion surveys confirm this before, during, and after the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The well-regarded 2022 edition of the Edelman Trust Barometer, with a two-decade-long history of comparing trust levels globally, is typical. In terms of overall trust by the general population, Edelman asked respondents in 27 countries to indicate how much they trusted their own countries, NGOs, business, government, and media, quote, to do what is right, unquote. And in the latest trust barometer, China, score, sky, China scored highest at 83%, and that's up 11% from 2021. The U.S. scored 43%, down 5% year on year, and not to mention a 10% drop from 2017. And that's uh, Donald Trump's first year in office. Um, in terms of energy specifically, uh, the Communist Party has to serve the people by addressing all three components of the trilemma that I mentioned. One way or another, the government needs to keep energy prices affordable. This was hard enough before uh, Russia's so-called special military operation was launched, but now it's even more tricky as global energy prices have gone through the roof. But I believe China's energy deal with Russia will guarantee sufficient supplies at affordable uh, prices in a long-term sustainable manner when coupled with China's impressive progress in renewable energy and its uh, temporarily increased fossil fuel production. The big question, though, is whether China's temporary reliance on fossil fuel, independent of the war, and many other countries' renewed reliance as a direct result of the war, will harm reaching global targets for 2030. Some worry because relevant data are collected in five-year increments. Global greenhouse gases must peak no later than 2025, and they say not by 2030. However, this is a virtual impossibility. Uh, perhaps our goose is not merely irreversibly cooked, but also maybe burnt uh, to a crisp. So China and the US are the two biggest global polluters. So it's obvious that they both need to exercise maximum leadership to achieve 1.5 centigrade. Um, but in the midst of an ever-deepening Cold War 2.0, which we unfortunately are right now, um, can both nations work together and can each reach its uh, nationally determined contribution? My answer, Carly, would have been different prior to June, June 30th, when the U.S. Supreme Court basically tied one hand behind the back of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. The ruling is ominous for the environment, but also the vast U.S. regulatory apparatus as well. 
prior to June 30th, I was optimistic because despite being in the midst of a new Cold War, China and the U.S. issued an unexpected joint declaration at COP26 in Glasgow on enhancing climate action in the 2020s. Why it's so important is that China and the U.S. are the leading greenhouse gas emitters. So their actions are potentially the most consequential. The declaration by both countries affirms their commitment to tackling climate change through their respective accelerated actions in the critical decade of the 2020s, as well as through cooperation in multilateral processes. It also calls for concrete action in the 2020s to reduce emissions aimed at keeping the Paris Agreement aligned temperature limit within reach, including in the areas of methane production, decarbonization, and forest protection. Few thought that such cooperation could take place when bilateral relations were in such a serious downward spiral. But they're a rare example of what's potentially possible, even in these desperate times when the stakes are so high and when national interests overlap. It's good to remember that the age-old scourge of smallpox, which killed more than 300 million people in the 20th century alone, was eradicated at the height of the Cold War because of US-USSR cooperation. It seems quite impossible, but it was done, and it, it was done by the leadership of several people on each side. But now, after June 30th, I'm not at all sure that the U.S. can meet its own NDCs. This is not merely because of the Supreme Court ruling, but because the pro-business, anti-regulation, reactionary Republicans are likely to recapture both houses of Congress this November. And two years after, Donald Trump, or a Trump with a brain, could retake the White House withdraw from the Paris Agreement as Trump did and give polluters an opportunity to wreak havoc and irreversible environmental damage, free of regulatory constraints. The US regulatory state really came on the scene full bore in the 1930s, and it overturned decades of jurisprudence that basically had said that market forces alone were sufficient to govern competition. And to regulate corporations and special interests was not a good thing. Courts then, together with the most national governments of the day uh, in the U.S., believed that it wasn't the job of government to interfere with business. Indeed, as the CEO of General Motors once famously said, what's good for General Motors is good for America. But especially after the Great Depression, people could see that the guardrails were needed to rein in the power of large corporations and special interest to prevent a repeat of that nearly catastrophic meltdown. An alphabet soup of regulatory agencies like the EPA, Securities and Exchange Commission, and FDA were created. And obviously, big business has resented that regulation and the cost of administration. So fast forward to the 1970s when the EPA itself was created by Congress. Many of the fat cat business people pooled their resources to especially finance nominees to those agencies who believed in a strictly hands-off approach. While it took a half century, they were finally able to rein in the EPA and other administrative agencies with a new model that in many cases, a deeply divided, overworked and understaffed Congress to themselves make laws, uh, many requiring in-depth expert knowledge rather than delegate those to agencies. This is a general recipe for a disaster, Carly, for the environment in particular, and it gives free reign to polluters to do more of what they want, and that is to freely pollute without government supervision or legal responsibility for the damage they cause. Using the currently in vogue but a highly questionable arcane analysis uh, that requires judges to review laws through an 18th century lens is just plain stupid and so speculative as to provide cover to decisions based on their own biases and not on legal precedents. So now I'm not at all sure that the two countries uh, are necessary but not sufficient to protect climate catastrophe. 
The U.S. and China, uh, I'm not sure, uh, can meet their total NDCs, uh, a precondition of the globe meeting 20 and 30 and uh, 2060 UN targets. That said, I believe China itself will meet their NDC goals and meet them early. It's a country that's done wonders using its governance model, especially five-year plans. Carly, I was taught in America that five-year plans in the Soviet Union were communist propaganda for a small group of leaders who made disastrous decisions that were divorced from supply and demand force realities. And maybe that was the case in the USSR, given its uh, meltdown in the 1980s and 90s. But this is very different from China's model. China's model of legislator, legislators and expert advisory committees from the local level on up help assure good governance. Now with the internet, robust participation from all stakeholders is sought before laws are enacted. And the results are nothing short of dramatic. In 1953, the beginning of China's first five-year plan, China's per capita income was around 50 US dollars. Today, with three times the population, the per capita income is over $10,000 and rising. And in roughly the same time period, life expectancy at birth, which is a very reliable measure of social advancement, grew steadily from 43 and a half years in 1950 to about 78 years and for the first time surpassed the US. Additionally, I believe that in China, where the concept of face is important, China would lose face in the eyes of its people and people globally if its NDCs weren't reached. Moreover, China and its governing model would look bad globally if its much trumpeted goals could not be reached. I really had hoped prior to the Supreme Court decision the, the U.S. and China would provide global leadership in what China's president told U.S. President Barack Obama, and that would be a new model of great power relations. But now, sadly, I really have grave, grave doubts about that. Yeah, that's very sad to hear. Um, yeah, let's hope for the best. Um, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so how is China doing with its renewable energy development? And uh, will renewable energy technology be sufficient to provide China's energy needs? In a word, China is doing spectacularly. The winds of change are literally blowing across China. Over the past decade, China has taken concrete steps to tackle carbon emissions. Its share of electricity produced from renewables has steadily increased from 18% to 29% in the decade since 2010. That's at a pace that beats the U.S. China is on track to generate at least 570 gigawatts of wind and solar power between 2021 and 2025, meaning that China's installed capacity for wind and solar power could more than double in just five years, reaching more than 1,100 gigawatts by 2025. Together with China's other plans for clean energy expansion, the new wind and solar power could allow China to peak its fossil fuel consumption and its CO2 emissions before 2025. This would put China on track to meet its renewable energy target uh, in 2026, and that's four years earlier than its latest uh, NDC. At the same time, China has been smartly moving up the R&D ladder. China is now the global leader in scientific research concerning renewable technologies and has produced, produced almost three times as many papers related to energy in 2020 as did the US. At, in 2018, China was awarded more than half of the world's patents in renewable energy and China's lead is actually expected to continue to increase. This reflects a general trend in China's rising mastery of innovation as confirmed by United Nations statistics. China also has a big lead in electric vehicle production. Of course, 
the most important component is the battery. EVs in the past have had restrictively short ranges, but this, it's changing. In June, China's leading automotive lithium ion battery maker announced a newly designed battery capable of more than a thousand kilometers or 621 miles between charges. That's come a long distance for batteries and it's a long distance between charges. That's great to hear, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, of course, we here in the West, we just know of Tesla, right? But in China, there's many other big players like BYD and others, yeah. Um, so how environmentally conscious is the Chinese population according to your experiences? And do you think more uh, environmental education is needed by the Chinese government? Well, Carly, the Chinese are very conscious of environmental issues. And the reason is that many experienced firsthand the effects of pollution and natural disasters before China was able to go all in on environmental leadership. And this was despite its burden of a huge population and until quite recently, it's impoverished economy. I can fondly, well, really not so fondly recall the Beijing airpocalypse of a few years ago when you couldn't see much further than the end of your hand. And everyone talked about the AQI or air quality index that was frequently off the charts. I remember that one of the most discussed was which expensive room air filter and personal mask or wearable filter was best. But that's just anecdotal information. There's also survey data from the European Investment Bank comparing China, the EU, and the US. The rigorous study results are really eye-opening. The survey confirms that a fear of climate change is widely shared in the three. Here across uh, Europe, 47% of Europeans rank climate change as the biggest challenge in their lives, closely followed by access to health care and health services and unemployment. By comparison, Americans rank climate change eight points lower at 39% behind access to health care and health services. But 73% of the Chinese surveyed think that climate change is the biggest challenge faced by society, far ahead of access to healthcare and health services um, at 47% and the financial crisis at 33%. On the flip side, perhaps because of Chinese people's faith in their leaders and government, 80% of Chinese respondents believe that climate change is reversible, while only 59% of Europeans and 54% of Americans do. So China has a huge head start uh, in terms of people's thinking when you compare it to the EU and the US. But in terms of education for Chinese citizens, starting from the youngest to the oldest, there's always room for more uh, education and more knowledge. And I'm convinced that the Chinese government is gonna continue that and also continue their efforts to do things like uh, separating garbage into the different recyclable uh, or non-recyclable components. And uh, I know that uh, when the Chinese government and the Chinese people commit to doing something, that they go all in. And this is why uh, the facts speak volumes. And that's why China's uh, uh, GDP per capita uh, grew uh, so much and why, why also the income of Chinese people um, grew uh, so much. And I believe that um, for the foreseeable future, uh, those numbers are going to rise. And I think China's gonna be, um, continue to be uh, a responsible stakeholder with regard to the environment and will in many ways set a shining example uh, for the rest of the world and be a player and a cooperator with the rest of the world. Thank you very much, Harvey. So 
basically there is still hope uh, not much but a little bit so we all have to uh, uh, give some efforts to to find a solution to this problem right yeah, yeah right because uh, i think that it's uh, we're we're almost at the point of no return and in some ways we've passed the point of, point of no return on the environment and uh, because of that, we have to redouble our efforts on a individual, a national, and a global basis. And uh, I hope that the temperatures we've seen uh, recently, uh, the horrendous uh, storms we've seen recently, uh, uh, can be contained and reversed in the years to come. But uh, there's some flaw in human beings uh, that we don't react often when disaster until disaster is upon us and that it's almost too late so i think these tragic uh, events that we've seen natural events that we've seen recently and that are getting worse and worse are uh, a call to do something now before it's too late so i'm really happy today to have the opportunity to talk about this and i know that each and every one of us are trying to do our parts as individuals, as uh, opinion leaders, as uh, members of various communities to make sure that we still have air to breathe. And even more importantly, that our children and our children's children have air to breathe as well. Again, thank you very much, Harvey, for this invaluable information about China and the environment. And uh, wish you a great day. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Carly, you too.